Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Breast cancer, a disease many women fear more than any other, even though heart disease is the number one killer of both men and women. Nonetheless, breast cancer is fairly common. In fact, after skin cancer, breast cancer is the most common cancer diagnosed in the United States among women. There have been significant advances in diagnosis and treatment of breast cancer over the past decades. Survival is increased and the number of deaths from breast cancer is steadily declining. And the surgery for breast cancer and reconstruction is better than ever. But there is still some controversy when it comes to mammography. Joining us in studio is Mayo Clinic breast cancer surgeon, Dr. Amy Degnam. Welcome to the program, Dr. Degnam. It's nice to meet you. Hello. Good to be with you. Okay, Dr. Degnam, let's start out with a little controversy because I think the breast cancer surgeons in this country, or maybe even the world, just add a little fuel to the mammogram controversy fire. Right, they definitely did. So I think this really initially ignited uh, back in 2016 when the United States uh, Preventive Task Force uh, Service issued guidelines to suggest that mammography maybe did not need to be do be done every year starting at age 40 and that instead that really could be started at age 50 and only be performed every other year instead of every year and that generated quite a bit of um, media coverage and controversy uh, and in response to that then the American Cancer Society uh, reviewed their policy and issued an update and they kind of came in with an intermediate position recommending starting screening uh, at age 45, uh, and now the American Society of Breast Surgeons has reviewed data and issued a new guideline as well. So what's different <laughs> about the American Society of Breast Surgeons guideline is that it specifically advocates for risk-based screening, saying that we're not going to screen everyone the same way. We're going to start by assessing a woman's risk, and the higher risk women would get a more intensive screening approach and the lower risk women would get an average sc risk screening approach. That makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Makes it? a lot of sense because what some people think, I mean, there was a lot of confusion with that. You know, should I start at 40, do I wait until 50? And if the answer is, well, it depends, that made confusion for people, but if you explain why it depends, I think it makes more sense. Right, well, we know that doing screening mammograms does have some risk in the sense that there's a small amount of radiation delivered. And in addition to that, the, the point of screening is to potentially find something and evaluate it with a biopsy. But many of those biopsies can be benign. So we are you know, having a, a substantial number of women then have a biopsy that turns out to be benign, but they have the anxiety uh, associated with that. And uh, you know, the, the pain of the procedure, even though it is a minor procedure, uh, and, and they could have a small complication, such as some localized bleeding or a very rare chance of an infection. So for those reasons, we have to remember that uh, mammography does have some risks, although they are limited. And we have to weigh that against the potential benefits of catching a cancer at an early stage when it is more treatable. Now, when should a woman do this risk uh, assessment? So and how do you do it? What the American Society of Breast Surgeons is recommending is a risk assessment for women starting at the age of 25. And essentially it, it consists of a good history, uh, asking women about their risk factors for breast cancer. And in those early younger years, we're really looking for the biggest risk factors. The first one would be a genetic predisposition or uh, a genetic mutation that is passed down in a family that would increase a person's risk. And the two most common mutations that are known of right now are BRCA1 and BRCA2, but there are other genetic mutations that can also increase breast cancer risk. But we screen for those just by asking a woman, does she have a history of breast cancer in her family? Does she have a history of other uh, family members who had ovarian cancer? Uh, or other malignancies, you know, tumors in the family. Uh, and by taking that history, we get some sense of whether there would be a chance of one of these mutations running in the family that would tell us that person definitely has an increased risk. And genetic testing would be something that women might choose to do. If they choose not to do genetic testing, we still know, just based on their family history, some information about what their risk would be for a breast cancer. 
So that is probably the biggest driving factor to assess risk in a younger woman. Uh, other less common uh, scenarios would be uh, if a woman has had prior chest radiation uh, between the ages of 10 and 30, usually that would occur for lymphoma treatment, uh, which go. is also That's rare. Tracy. That's me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and the third potential uh, factor that would drive an increased risk would be if a woman has had a biopsy that showed some abnormal findings, such as atypical hyperplasia or something called lobular carcinoma in situ, which is not truly a cancer, uh, but a, a risk marker uh, for potential increased risk of cancer in the future. So those would be the major things that we would be screening for just with a history, uh, talking to women in those earlier, younger age groups about their cancer risk. Now there are mammograms and there are mammograms, and I think you also recommended that uh, women have a 3D Mammogram is that pretty standard now? Do, do most clinics have a 3D mammogram or tomosynthesis? I think it's also it is called. pretty standard. Yes, so okay. tomosynthesis mammography and 3D mammography really mean the same thing, and what it does is it allows the radiologist to see several different pictures of the breast instead of just a single. Uh, picture from each view of the breast so they can get more information about potentially what is on the inside of the breast tissue. And that's especially good if you have dense breasts. It is better if you have dense breasts. And are, are there other studies that you might want to do if you do have dense breasts other than in addition to or instead of 3D mammography? Sure. So uh, the guidelines that the American Society of Breast Surgeons has recommended is kind of divide women into two categories, women who have average risk and women who we know have an increased risk. Uh, if a woman has average risk, but on their mammogram they have high density, then it is recommended that they consider supplemental screening. If a woman is in that higher risk category due to other factors, such as a genetic mutation, a strong family history, uh, prior radiation or one of these uh, biopsy, you know, high risk lesions, then they would be recommended to consider supplemental screening and start that at an earlier age. And the other thing your group talked about was the fact that if a woman's expected survival is 10 years or less, you can stop having mammograms. That makes sense to me too. It does. Uh, the challenge there is that we still don't have the crystal ball of <laughs> who knows <laughs> when, when do we know that a woman is only going to live 10 more years. Right. One of the things I think is interesting, though, is um, instead of there being this guideline, you know, start at 40, it's more it's dependent on each person's situation. And then does that give patients the feeling of a little bit more control or advocacy for their own health? We certainly hope so. I mean, that is the whole goal and was a driving factor in the U.S. Preventive Task Force recommendations that they wanted women to have a conversation with their provider to understand that there are some risks to mammography or some disadvantages of doing mammography very frequently and at a young age and th to be aware uh, of what those potential you know, consequences are and be doing their screening with purpose instead of just as a rote uh, practice. All right, you know, it all makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, surgeons are smarter than we're sometimes given credit for. Let's face it. <laughs> you, Dr. You're, Amy you're Dignam, on board with this. That's right. <laughs> Breast cancer. Mammograms are still the gold standard for detecting it early. Who's at increased risk? Well, it's worth doing a risk assessment when you're a young woman and then discussing with your doctor how often you should have the tests and when you should start having them. Time for a short break. When we come back, we're going to talk about breast cancer surgery and some recent advances in breast cancer surgery, including sparing the nipple. Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McCray. We are with breast cancer surgeon Dr. Amy Degnam from the Mayo Clinic. We've talked about the new guidelines suggested by your group is the American, American Society, Society of, of Breast Surgeons. Cancers. Okay, perfect. <laughs> and everything you've said so far makes a lot of sense to both of us. So let's talk about surgery. That's your uh, field of endeavor. Would you say that the majority of, of women who have breast cancer need surgery? Yes, currently that is the status. Uh, certainly there is research going forward to you know, continue to try to develop alternate therapies, uh, but at the current time, 
yes, women who have breast cancer still need surgery as a component of their treatment. And then how do you decide what surgery they need? How do you decide whether they, they need a lumpectomy, whether they need a mastectomy, whether they need a bilateral mastectomy? Tell us about that, how you go about that. Sure. Well, sometimes it's an easy decision and sometimes it's a lot more complicated. Uh, it depends on the extent of the disease. If the disease is very extensive involving you know, more than 50% of the breast, then there really is not usually an option to preserve the breast. Sometimes we can apply chemotherapy before surgery to try to shrink a tumor and make it smaller and more amenable to a lumpectomy. But sometimes the disease is just so extensive that a lumpectomy is not possible. If you do a lumpectomy, you always follow that with radiation, right? Or sometimes you might do the radiation before. Well, for invasive cancers, yes, we recommend a lumpectomy and then radiation afterwards. Um, there are some very unusual circumstances where we might recommend radiation first, but that is not the norm approach. I know we've had uh, previous breast surgeons who are in and talk about you start the surgery and then you're sending it to the lab while the surgery is going on to make sure you've got those margins clear. That seems to make a lot of sense to me, but that must make the surgery a lot longer as well. It does increase the surgery length a little bit, but it's, um, I think, more cost effective overall and better for the patient to just have one surgery. And uh, we find that that's the best approach for patient care. So you're doing that more often now? It's routine to use frozen section evaluation in our practice at the Mayo Clinic. And how do you decide whether or not you need to remove any or all lymph nodes? So. Lymph node evaluation is recommended whenever the type of cancer is invasive, which, mean it, which means it does have the ability to move throughout the body. And usually if it's going to spread, it will spread to the lymph nodes first. So that's why that's the best area to check to see if there's ev any evidence that the disease is starting to transfer. However, if a woman has a non-invasive cancer, something we call DCIS, which stands for ductal carcinoma in situ, then we do not need to evaluate lymph nodes. Can you tell sometimes on uh, preoperative imaging whether or not the lymph nodes are involved or at least the image might suggest that they are? Yes, if the image shows abnormally enlarged lymph nodes, that's a good sign, uh, or I shouldn't say a good sign, but a strong sign that the lymph nodes may be involved. However, if the lymph nodes appear normal on the imaging, it doesn't completely rule out that there still might be cancer cells in those lymph nodes that we could only see by looking with a microscope. You know, I think uh, we talk so often about if the cancer has moved into the lymph nodes. Um, for the layperson, why does it matter? if it Does it go through the body via the lymph system, or why does it matter if it's in the lymph nodes? It helps us to understand uh, what the likelihood is of the cancer being elsewhere. If it is in the lymph nodes, there's a higher chance that it might be present somewhere else in the body. And there's a higher chance that the cancer might return in the future. And so that helps us to determine what other treatments we should be providing to that patient. Uh, for cancer that's in the lymph nodes, we are likely to be more uh, aggressive or intensive with our therapies because of that higher risk of cancer spread. What about the, the question might come up about, should I have both of my breasts removed? How do you help a woman decide that? This is a really common question that, that comes up. And it's really a very personal choice. We spend a lot of time counseling women about this choice and helping them to fight, find the right answer for them. Uh, we do know you know, convincingly that removing a woman's other breast does not make her live any longer. However, it will reduce her chance of getting a cancer in that breast and having to potentially go through cancer treatment. On the other hand, there are definitely downsides to having both breasts removed. It doubles the risk of surgical complications because instead of operating on one site, we're operating on two. And when the breast is removed, there's a loss of sensation in that breast. It doesn't feel normal. Even with reconstruction, we can have really great results, but there's still a substitute for the real thing. So it does lead to some change for women in their body image. 
All right, let's talk about uh, reconstruction. How do you help a woman decide that, and and what can you do, and uh, and what will the breasts look like if you do have reconstruction, and if you don't? Again, this is a lot of time, you know, that we spend talking to women about what their options are. Uh, there are two main approaches for reconstruction. One is to do a reconstruction using implants, and the other is to do a reconstruction using her own tissue to replace the volume that is removed with the breast at the time of a mastectomy. Um, and, you know, we recommend that she think about these things carefully. There is certainly also the option to not do any reconstruction, and some women prefer that. Uh, there's less extensive surgery, potentially an easier recovery, and those women can choose to use an external prosthesis in a, in a bra after surgery. So it's, again, really a very personal choice. Uh, we spend a lot of time with women trying to help them understand these different options and find the right match for them. But you can actually now move the, remove the breast, save the nipple, and do the reconstruction, and basically all in the same operation. In many cases, we can. And this is what we call nipple sparing mastectomy, where we are able to keep the skin of the entire breast, including the skin of the nipple. We take out all of the breast tissue from underneath and really essentially there are no visible scars after the surgery other than what is at the bra line. And we, we really have, the techniques have allowed us to provide excellent cosmetic outcomes. Is there any nerve connection or is that all severed? There is a loss of sensation after this surgery and the degree varies from person to person. That's an area where we're still learning more about you know, is there a difference based on this type of incision or that, you know, location of incision that maybe, you know, impacts that? So we still have more to learn there. I read an article a few years ago about the differences when it comes to reconstruction uh, with European women versus American women, which leads me to believe that this is, there is a difference, that there must be a, a huge psychological component that can and I would hope is addressed for women when they're trying to make this because they've never been in this situation before. How can they know? Correct. And that is one of the reasons that we counsel women that uh, maybe they don't want to remove both breasts when they're not sure yet how mm -hmm. they would feel about it. So you can remove a breast that has cancer and leave the other one alone and think about it and, and see how it goes. Uh, but again, there's no one size that fits right. all. It's a very uh, personal decision and a personalized discussion. If you're going to use a woman's own tissue to reconstruct the breast, is that more complicated? And how do you do that? It's definitely a longer surgery, and it is more complicated. Um, in our practice here, we work with plastic surgeons, uh, both to do either type of reconstruction, the both the implant approach as well as a reconstruction using their own tissue. Often that tissue is taken from a woman's belly area, uh, and then moved up to fill the volume where the breast was removed. Uh, but that is a longer surgery and a longer recovery. It has the benefit that then there are no implants in the long run, and that's appealing to many women. And either way, the breasts look pretty normal when you're all done. Usually the breasts are going to have a great result at the end. Um, you know, there isn't any panacea, and some women do have specific challenging individual circumstances in which we might not be able to offer them either an implant reconstruction or vice versa, we might not be able to offer them a tissue reconstruction. And um, But usually we can find some option for reconstruction for almost all women. I know that the women who are your patients are very grateful for everything that you do. Significant advances in the surgical treatment of breast cancer, including nipple sparing mastectomy. Breast cancer surgeon, Dr. Amy Degnam, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you.